Hey y'all, howdy. As you probably know, there are tens of millions of outlaws living in our world, doing all sorts of criminal stuff. But one of them left a permanent mark in the global history of the criminal underworld. We're talking about Pablo Escobar. His biography spawned dozens of movies, books, games, and songs. So after his death, he became even more popular than he was. In this episode, you'll find out how Pablo became the cocaine king, how he wanted to run for president, and just how much he was raking in. Get comfy, y'all. Let's dive in. It all started with the love story of farmer Jesus and schoolteacher Hilda. In the small Colombian town of Rio Negro, they had a kid they named Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria. After that, they all moved to Medellin, where nobody suspected that this little tyke would become the number one criminal in the world. He grew up in poor neighborhoods with not much to do, no clubs, leisure, or entertainment. So Pablo started his criminal journey as a teenager, started with illegal cigarette sales and fake lottery tickets. Then he moved on to more serious stuff, selling stolen tombstones, marijuana, and stolen cars. He grew up a tough kid, destined to become a bandit. By the age of 22, he was already deeply involved in racketeering. He had his own crew who followed his every order. One of his most notorious tasks was the kidnapping of wealthy Colombian businessman Diego Echeverri. After they couldn't get a ransom, they got rid of him. Everyone knew about it. Pablo became a hero in his hometown of Medellin because people saw him as a kind of Robin Hood, taking from the rich and helping the poor. And he did help them. Instead of blowing all his money on a lavish lifestyle, he built houses for those in need. A year later, Escobar was the most infamous criminal in the region. Half the folks were scared of him, and the other half respected and supported him. At one point, Pablo decided to change his line of work and switch professions. No, he wasn't planning to become an artist or a chef. He decided to get into cocaine. Pablo didn't start with production, but rather acted as a middleman, buying drugs from one set of dealers and selling them to others, but at a higher price. Pablo knew how to make money. At the age of 26, he had accumulated $3 million. Check this out, man. Since Pablo couldn't have bank accounts, he kept all the cash he made at home or with his buddy, stashed away in the basement. Every year, rats living in the basement would munch on and ruin the dollar stored there, totaling around $2 billion. After that, he began developing his own cocaine empire. His people started creating actual farms for producing the white powder, which they then sold all over America in massive quantities, transporting them by cars, planes, and even submarines. At some point, Pablo got tired of running from the police, so he decided to buy them off, and those who opposed him were eliminated. Escobar's motto became, silver or lead, take a bribe or get a bullet. The first failure didn't take long to arrive. He and a few accomplices were caught with 18 kilograms of cocaine paste. To avoid arrest, Pablo offered huge bribes to the judges, but they refused. So he ordered the killing of all officers involved in his arrest. Surprisingly, after the death of the witnesses, all charges were dropped. This was the turning point when Escobar realized how to deal with the government. His business was booming, supplying more than 80% of all cocaine to the USA, almost 80 tons of powder per month. With his earnings, he bought a massive piece of land and built his own zoo, mansion, lake, garden, sculptures, and even a bullfighting arena. He had a 141 houses, 142 planes, 20 helicopters, and 32 yachts. He didn't forget his hometown either. To garner support from the people, he built roads, free houses for the poor, and even stadiums in Medellin. Money was truly flowing like a river. At one point, he became not only the richest man in Colombia, but in the world. Forbes estimated his fortune at $9 billion, but in reality, it was much more. This is evidenced by the fact that Pablo offered to pay off all of Colombia's external debt if they allowed him to conduct his business legally. We're talking at least $15 billion. And this could have happened if the USA hadn't promised to send troops in case of agreement. But even in the criminal world, there's a career ceiling. Reaching it, Pablo decided to enter politics, but being a small-time official or some mayor didn't satisfy him. He decided to run for president. Probably that became the biggest mistake of his life. Investigations started against him, 
revealing to the people who their idol really was. Escobar wasn't idol either. He killed anyone who crossed his path in any way. In the USA, they finally decided to strike at the man poisoning their entire state. They struck a deal with the Colombian government, who had to catch the main drug lord and hand him over. In response, Escobar created a terrorist group called Los Extraditables. Its members killed anyone supporting the idea of extraditing Pablo to America. They executed half of all judges, dozens of politicians, and hundreds of police officers. Once, the bandits even blew up a passenger plane with 107 people on board. Despite Escobar's aggressive actions, the government was closing in on him more and more. Then, he resorted to desperate measures. His people kidnapped several of the wealthiest individuals in Colombia, hoping that their influential relatives could prevent his extradition. And believe it or not, it worked. However, in return, he had to surrender and go to prison. Though, you couldn't even dream of those prison conditions in your regular life. Pablo himself built an entire building for himself, which turned out better than any five-star hotel. There was a football field, a bar, a billiard room, a jacuzzi, and a waterfall. And the most interesting part was that he could come and go as he pleased. So, the arrest posed no problem for him in running his dirty business. The government turned a blind eye to it all until he started killing people in there. Authorities ordered to capture the cocaine king and put him in a real prison. Upon learning about this decision, Pablo escaped, although calling it an escape is a stretch. The guards themselves led him through the central gates. After that, things didn't go so well for him. All friends and colleagues turned away from him, enemies multiplied. He still had immense financial resources, but alas, no power. One day, he even hid in the mountains with his daughter and son without shelter. The night was so cold that he had to warm his children with money. Pablo burned $2 million to make sure they wouldn't freeze completely. He tried once again to negotiate with the government, but all attempts were in vain. The U.S. and Colombian authorities finally decided to finish off Escobar and destroy the empire he had built. And so it happened in the end. The next day, after he turned 44, he decided to call his family with whom he chatted for more than five minutes. Because of this, police and intelligence agents pinpointed his location. In no time, the house where he was hiding was surrounded. A shootout ensued, the outcome of which was predetermined from the beginning. Pablo was shot in the leg, then the back, and finally, a control shot to the head. Although there's a version that he shot himself to avoid being taken alive. 25,000 people came to the funeral of the drug trafficker, wanting to bid farewell to their beloved Robin Hood. But they didn't suspect that this man had 4,000 lives on his conscience and hundreds of thousands who suffered from drug use. After Pablo's death, his brainchild, the Medellin cartel, was taken over by competitors. But they couldn't manage the gigantic business for long. The organization's top leaders were soon arrested, and the empire fell apart. Now, Colombian drug traffickers haven't disappeared anywhere, and maybe they've become even more powerful. But unlike Pablo, they prefer to lead a discreet lifestyle. No one knows their names, their wealth, or the volume of the goods they produce. That's what it means to learn from others' mistakes. Liked the episode? Whose biography would you like to know more details about? Write your suggestions in the comments. Meanwhile, hit the likes, subscribe to the channel, and share this video with your friends. See you all later.